This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, Energy in America, that's Lou Pugliarisi. He joins us from Washington, D.C. He's the CEO of EPRINC, which is an energy policy research think tank. And uh, he's, well, I'm so happy to see him. Um, hi, Lou. Welcome back to your show. Hi. Great, Great to be here. <laughs> so uh, you have, a, you have a, a conference coming up uh, in Mexico City in a, in a few weeks um, involving mostly petroleum, but energy in general in Mexico. And right. we, we sure want to know about, we just, we just had a show with our old correspondent, Carlos Suarez. Uh, he's, he's with the uh, University of Puebla, which is right near Mexico City. And we're talking mm -hmm. about international relations and what's happening there. And it's, it's really interesting stuff. But so is energy. Energy is always interesting. So can we talk about Mexico and energy today? Yeah, so let, let, let me start with some background on why this is very important to the United States and actually to the broader North American hemisphere. Um, in Prior to the election of AMLO, or, you know, Andre Manuel Lopez Obrador. Nice. Who is the new president, yes, <laughs> who is the new president of Mexico, who's quite an interesting character. He uh, defeated the longstanding uh, Institutional Revolutionary Party, or the PRI, and uh, he has done lots of interesting things. <laughs> the first thing he has done is stop. the competitive process for the development of new uh, power plants, including solar and wind under competitive the Yank, you know, the resistance against Yankee imperialism back to the 30s. And so he took on all, the PRI took on all these things. Yet, even though by any outside observer would say this was an open, very productive, very rational process for Mexico, the PRI could not overcome a legacy of corruption. Mm. And they lost the election. Not only did they lost, lose the election, they got wiped out. Because uh, AMLO has control of the, his party, or his party coalition controls the, uh, the legislature as well. And in fact, before the election, I was invited to Mexico with uh, the head of the Oxford Institute of Energy Studies to talk about uh, energy reform and oil and gas development with uh, different political parties. And it was a quite you know, interesting event. We went down there and my colleague from London had like 45 technical slides and we met with Overdoor, Overdoor's people, and he said, uh, uh, okay, I, 
I can't go to this meeting, guys, but I'm going to Mexico City. I mean, I'm going to uh, up to Monterey. But you go in the room there and uh, have a you know, have a very substantive discussion. And we got in the room. There's like a thousand people. They invited the party regulars to pre-lunch. There are kids running around in front of the stage. <laughs> so <laughs> I told Boss, I don't think you're going to be able to use your slides for this group, you know. So <laughs> so it's it's it's, it's a, actually I re- if you haven't been to Mexico City, I really recommend it. It's it's very interesting, very dynamic. A lot of interesting things going on right now. Well, tell us about so energy. Tell us about energy yeah. in Mexico. What's the status? So what I th- so I think that you have this, you know, you have this enormous reform that's taken place over the last four years, and because quote the other guys did it, it must be bad. Okay. So the new administration <laughs> under AMLO, right? We have that in the U.S. a lot. And remember, they had to chi- change the constitution to do this. This is not a small th- that thing that was accomplished, and so AMLO has been very. Uh, he had a lot of derogatory comments. He's been very dismissive of the energy reform. And so one, one of the efforts that I think we're going to participate in is a kind of, okay, what do we as upside observers think about this issue? And, and for anybody in your audience who might be interested, we've just issued a paper on Mexico, and they can pull that right off the website, which discusses what is the value of the new energy model? or the model that was introduced over the last four years in the last administration. Mm-hmm. I thought that's what we would talk about tonight and what it means for some of the ambitious plans uh, AMLO has for Mexican energy, but also what he has in, his, in terms of his relationship with the United States. So that, that paper is on eprink.org? Right. E-P-R-I-N-C right there, right, right right dot O-R-G. Okay. Right, and you'll see, uh, and, and it's all, and, and it's a, it's a big paper on Mexico. Mm-hmm. Very easy to read. So uh, you mentioned before the show that uh, you, you know your involvement, your your panel, your presentation, uh, in this in this conference here in a couple of weeks, largely on uh, petroleum. But can you can you tell us the balance these days of um, solar and and wind, I suppose, uh, and other things so, against know, petroleum in Mexico? So. so First, I just give you the statistic. Everyone, everyone talks about solar and wind. Everyone loves solar and wind. It's a great thing, but it's not now. Three percent of the energy in the United States is generated by wind and solar. Okay, mm-hmm. don't get too excited. It's not making a big difference yet. <laughs> and in Mexico, it's the same thing. It's going to be helpful. It's going to play an important part in the future of Mexican energy. But right now, the big environmental payoff in Mexico is to stop burning the oil and try to substitute natural gas. Mm, right. And that's where the U.S. comes in because we are a very big supplier of natural gas to Mexico. We are also a very big supplier of uh, petroleum products, including gasoline and diesel. So does Mexico so, have indigenous uh, oil? Does it have indigenous gas? It does. It does. In fact, maybe we should go to the first uh, slide. Sure. First picture. The first picture shows how important is the pro- petroleum sector as a percent of gross domestic product in Japan, in Mexico. And the thing to keep up Mexico is that their petroleum production has been falling for years. That's why they did the reforms. Because mm-hmm. Pemex just did not, you know, Pemex was starved by money by the government. The government used it as a piggy bank and didn't really invest enough, right? And you can see here that You go back to 1995, the national economy of uh, Mexico, uh, petroleum was pretty important. It was about 14%, 13%, 14%. But over time, both the direct and indirect uh, indirect activity has declined to close to 8%. So petroleum is not as important to Mexico as it used to be. And what many people don't understand is that Mexico is an energy user. It is, in all respects, a modern industrial c- country. Mm-hmm. It produces lots of uh, capital goods, lots of automobiles. It, it has a lot of industrial activity. Yes, it's a country with a lot of income inequality, a big difference between the north and the south. But it is a big energy user. It's a very important industrial economy. 
in the Northern Hemisphere, in, in the Western Hemisphere. 122 million people. So that's the people. kind of background. 122 right. million people. There, and many of them are, and it's a very young population, so it's a very dynamic place. And actually, I'm, I'm pretty positive about the future for Mexico. There are lots of problems, but I think people don't see the upsides often in the press. Mm -hmm. So, that, so that, that sort of gives you the background of where we are. And one of the, one of the, the new energy model, which that was the sort of instrument of the last administration there, was really trying to direct this falling oil production, falling gas production, the inadequate infrastructure for distributing gasoline, et cetera. So if we go to the next slide, I think it shows you a kind of how to think about the Mexican economy. I, uh, trade, repairs, transport, it is in many respects, in all respects, it is a modern economy. And I think we don't really under, understand that someplace. And it's a kind of, you know, right there, it's an important economy in the Pacific Rim. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe, I'm not sure if they've signed up for the, they're not part of the TPP yet, but I think they're, they're looking at it, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's go to the next guy. So the next thing is, so why, why is this important? You know, why is this new energy model and this reform important? And you can see here that uh, here's a picture that shows you on the blue line in billions of dollars, right? Mm -hmm. um, the government tax revenue. That's the blue line. And government tax revenue in Mexico since 2010 has risen substantially from 250 to uh, nearly 400 uh, billion dollars. Mm -hmm. But the revenue generated by Pemex, the state oil company, has continued to fall. And one of the big areas of contention now is AMLO has said, look, I think it was a mistake to do these energy reforms because we need to give this money to Pemex. Right. Right? We need to get Pemex to have this money, the state oil company. They, they can do this job. But the evidence suggests that if you look at Pemex payments to the government since 2010, they're not really doing a very good job. They're not generating a lot of cash for the government. And so I think there's a sense, in my sense, is a lot of the new team from AMLO, much like you see in the U.S., they don't really know much about this issue yet. They come in with a, they've come in with a series of assumptions. Uh, kind of perspective, but that perspective has not been validated by any research or fact. So when one day they're going to realize that the state oil isn't making any money, and what? They're going to have to do something about it in favor of non-state oil, no? Yeah, so I'm going to, we're going to, so that, that's actually a very important issue. And one of the reasons we wrote this paper was, and actually the paper is called, what is the value of the new energy model? to Mexico, not to the U.S., to Mexico. How should they think about those reforms that took place? Because from a public policy point of view, we think it's a mistake for them to abandon those reforms. Of course, they're, they're new in town, so to speak. They have their own ideas, and they're going to have to sort of figure this out themselves. But the evidence suggests that, this could, that these reforms, even though they were, instrument, they were implemented by the PRI, they were implemented by the other guy, they're not necessarily bad. Actually, mm -hmm. they have a lot of potential, and, and they have a lot of potential to help AMLO on the basic thing he's worried about, which is getting cash to deal with income inequality. Is he, uh, is he independent of the, uh, <laughs> of the energy industry, of the, of the national energy company? I mean, can he, yeah, uh, no, can he do what he wants? Oh, yeah, yeah. He has a lot of authority. I mean, I think... Uh, Pemex has a special place in the hearts of Mexicans. It's, you know, it's, it's very much attached to the, in the 1930s when Mexico nationalized the industry throughout the Yankee over, overlords, you know. And so within Mexico, it's a, it's a really part of the national patrimony. So even making these changes in the last administration was an enormous effort. You know, you have to change the Constitution. But they were able to do that. So I, actually, I really think this is a, a, a terrific story because here's the PRI with this terrible legacy of corruption, which actually did the right thing over the last four years. 
But in the election, they couldn't get past this legacy. <laughs> and they went down. <laughs> well, at that at that point in, in the story, we'll take a break, Lou. Yeah. That's Lou Pugliarisi. Okay. He's okay. the CEO of ePrink, and that's ePrink.org. You can see the paper he was referring to on his website. We'll take a minute. We'll come back, and we'll hear more about how, how energy is evolving in Mexico and what he's going to talk yeah. about. And we'll see some more of his slides, too. We'll be right back. Yeah. <laughs> This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. If you're not in control of how you see yourself, then who is? Live above the influence. When I was growing up, I was among the one in six American kids who struggle with hunger. But with the power of breakfast, the kids in your neighborhood can think big and be more. Go to hungeris.org to make breakfast happen for kids in your neighborhood. みなさんこんにちは。ThinkTechHawaiが日本語でお届けする。こんにちはハワイの日本語コミュニティに便利なお助け情報、ニュースなどをゲストをお招きしてお届けする番組です。こんにちは。ハワイ。各州の月曜日2時から是非皆さん見てください。ホストの国勢ゆかりでした。あの、3、2、1、we're <笑> Show us in terms of okay. The... Let's go to the next one. I think uh, people have a the next one shows petroleum revenue in various nations. This is an exciting slide, and uh, I think the really the lesson I'd like people to see from this slide is that if you have a big economy like the U.S. or Mexico, and there's people like me talking about uh, oil and gas. In fact, I don't think people really realize how big it is. The world oil market, oil and gas market, probably transacts four trillion dollars a year in commodities. Right. So if you take all the gas and petroleum products and crude oil and the derivative, you know, the, the basic fundamental products that are made worldwide, that comes to about four trillion dollars a year. It is a big, big business. Mm -hmm. It's not going to. They're not going to get rid of all oil and gas by 2030 when it's worth $4 trillion. It's going to take longer than that. Mm -hmm. So if you look at this tape, this this uh, kind of graph here, it shows on, on the vertical axis, right, oil and gas exports as a share of total exports. You know, How important are oil and gas exports to the whole economy? And then along the, on, on the horizontal axis, it shows you oil and gas revenue as a proportion of fiscal revenue. So, so if you're sort of thinking about this, quite a bit, let's start with the U.S. The U.S. is the biggest economy in the world, right? We are now the world's largest oil producer. But our economy is so big, right, that oil and gas exports as a share of our total exports is very small. And it's not that important to the whole revenue of the economy. We collect lots of money from lots of people in the economy. Mm -hmm. And Mexico is a little bit more dependent, but not much. So you see Mexico, <laughs> Canada, United Kingdom, all big oil players in one way or the other. But their economies are so big, it's not an overwhelming issue. Right? Nigeria, Kuwait, the Arabs, you know, the traditional producers, Venezuela, they are dependent on this commodity. Mm -hmm. And so that means within Mexico, it's not, it, sh it should be a kind of solvable problem. You should be able to get it more efficient. So if we go to the next one, well, before we I do, want to show you. Uh, uh, yeah. Just uh, Mexico and, and Canada are uh, almost identical on that graph. Yeah. So right, I guess right. that what that tells, I mean, in my recollection is Western Canada is pumping out oil and gas like there was no tomorrow. They have a huge industry and they and they know how to extract it from the tar sands up there and and the result is right, right. exporting an awful lot of oil from it's it's the biggest industry in 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 uh, those two uh, provinces mm -hmm. of both calgary uh, rather alberta and british columbia 
And and so and we are their number one uh, buyer. Yes, we are their only buyer, actually. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. But so uh, that yeah. but that sort of puts it in perspective as against Mexico. Mexico must have a huge yeah. amount um, of of oil and gas that it it exports too. If they're so close on the chart. It, yeah, it uses a lot in in internally, but it exports a lot, mostly to the United States. Mm -hmm. So we have a very extensive two-way trade with Mexico. We are selling them a very large volume of pipeline gas. So the economic reform in Mexico, the, the allowing the market forces to drive out higher cost alternatives like oil or dirtier alternatives like coal, right, that's a good thing for the U.S. because it provides an outlet for our natural gas supplies, which are uh, – Big and growing. So, could Mexico so, be, be uh, could Mexico be independent, self-reliant on what it has? Why why does it have to both import uh, okay. and export at the same time? So, this is actually a great question because this is exactly what AMLO talks about, and that's why. So, AMLO is saying, um, "Well, this is ridiculous. You know, we have energy security." We shouldn't be buying all this gas from the U.S. Let's make our own gas. Or these gasoline prices are high because we're buying them from the U.S. It turns out that that is probably an incorrect statement. Uh, petroleum products, gasoline are traded on the world market, and the new energy reform actually makes gasoline prices lower in Mexico. Pemex failed to make the investments in refineries and infrastructure. So AMLO has a proposal, eight to nine billion dollars, right, to build new refineries, to build and expand a new refinery in Mexico. The question is, is that a good idea? And uh, and I, the question I ask Mexicans to think about, is this the best use of that money? Mm -hmm. Maybe that money is better off for schools or something else, because I think I can show you how that's not going to lower the price of gasoline. Ah, okay. And uh, so that takes me to the next picture, right? The next picture shows you royalties from planned oil projects. Now, these are locked in. Okay? This is, and these royalty payments, right, and the, the different colors are different oil fields throughout Mexico, offshore, onshore. And one of the things we, I think the uh, economic team in AMLO is not quite familiar with is how much money is coming to them from the reforms of the new energy model, which leased these lands to private companies. And these private companies paid cash up front, plus a commitment to pay a, pay a percentage of their production in royalty payments. Mm -hmm. And so what he's going to learn eventually is that he has a slug of dough uh, by 2028, 20, 26, 7, 8, over $6 billion. And so he has announced that, you know, I don't want to do any more of this private uh, oil and gas development leasing. You know, it's not good for us. We should do it. Mm -hmm. But, of course, you know, they use Mexican workers and stuff in, the, in this process. But... If he has an ambitious plan to deal with income inequality in Mexico, he's going to need that money. And I think once they get familiar with this, it's going to be very interesting to see what they do. He's reorganizing um, a lot of things. One of the things we learned in our last show was about the airport in Mexico City. Yeah. It's a multi-billion dollar uh, remodel of the airport. Um, and uh, his predecessors uh, set it in motion. And uh, he's he's not... He's not going ahead with it. <laughs> I'm not sure why. Yeah, but I don't know what he's going to do. Apparently, he's the, he, he says the bondholders are going to be paid. I, I, don't know. I don't actually have an opinion on that airport. Whether It would be interesting to see whether your guest thought it was a good or a bad idea. I'm not sure. I mean. uh, well, it, he didn't say in so many <laughs> words, but the, the question is raised. <laughs> why, why let a project go one-third the way and then stop it? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So he's a very interesting character, so we're going to see. Now, if we go, uh, one of the things that I know all your guests, all your uh, your audiences is the environment, and I'd like to show you some of the environmental trends in Mexico. Um, this gets to the utility sector again. If you go to the next uh, picture, you can see 
These are Mexicans, Mexican sulfur dioxide emissions saved by uh, expected natural gas production, right? So the reform process, right, uh, is going to yield higher levels of natural gas production in Mexico. And you can see here that uh, uh, fuel oil and coal are going to be used much less. So the red line shows you fuel oil, and the blue line shows you coal. But as more U.S. gas is produced in Mexico, and actually more gas is imported from the U.S., the use of these two fuels begins to decline. Mm -hmm. It takes a bit longer than many people would like to see, but once again, it's not a substitute of renewables, if you like, or wind and solar, or coal, but it is moving along a gradient which reduces sulfur dioxide emissions. And if you go to the next slide, uh, uh, it shows you the real choice for AMLO. The red line shows you the Ministry of Energy's uh, supply from the new energy reform. So these are two separate forecasts on what the reform measures instituted by the defeated party <laughs> the PRI, is likely to yield in additional oil production. And the
<laughs> and and that, that stops everything. Um, so well, I Trump think it, says a lot of things. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, I don't know what to do with that. You know, that's not that's yeah, that's a ridiculous thing, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I always enjoy our conversations, though I mean, and and I, I really enjoy uh, you know posing these questions to you and having your answers on. It, it really is a tremendous education. So uh, we'll do this again in two weeks hence. I hope you'll be. We will. We I hope will. you'll be in a place we can reach you wherever your travels take you. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Aloha, Jay. Aloha. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lou Pudirisi, CEO of ePrink. <laughs>